Why do most sales presentations fail? We're exploring sales decks on this episode of Closing Time. Hey, I'm Val Riley, Head of Content Marketing at Insightly, and today I am joined by Todd Capone. He's an author, a speaker in the sales field, and a self-described transparency nerd. Welcome to the show, Todd. Thank you for having me. So Todd, I've built a lot of sales decks in my day, so I'm super excited about this topic. One of the things you talk about is choreography, which I'm hoping doesn't involve either of us dancing. Can you talk us through it? Well, when we think about choreography, right, we're thinking about the order by which we do our formal messaging, right? And that could take the form of slides or really the path that we take when we're in a formal environment with a buyer. But this isn't to get anybody in trouble, but the traditional choreography that we've experienced through all these years, right? And that traditional choreography, what I mean, it means like slide one is the mission statement. Like we believe in a world where we solve all these issues. And then slide number two is the awards or analyst reports, right? Slide number three, a lot of times, and I don't see this as much anymore, but I used to all the time. Slide number three used to be a map, right? It was like our offices, we've got one in Chicago and one in San Francisco. We've got one in Singapore. I know you don't, but we think it's cool. And then slide number four, a lot of times was the product slide, right? Like we have this product, this product, this product. And then there's a circle around it and it says solution. And then slide number five so often was the NASCAR slide, right? The logo slide. These are all the companies we work with that we are so proud of. Well, if you really look at the behavioral science, as it turns out, logic polarizes, but emotions and stories and feelings are what bring us together. And all that logic at the beginning of a presentation, it literally disengages and it polarizes audience into their preconceived opinions of how they felt when they were walking in. They will use the data and the research or whatever it is from those first five slides against you. And so I just truly believe there is a much better way, there's an easier way to reorder your formal messaging so that it not only tells a great story, but it becomes really compelling to audiences. Okay, so it sounds like you wanna take them on a more emotional journey versus a logical journey, is that right? Well, yeah, and I know this is gonna sound crazy, so like, don't turn this off when you hear it, but I have found, and again, this sounds crazy, but that following the choreography that's used in reality makeover TV shows, not only tells a great story, but it becomes really compelling to audiences and it is easy to apply to the world of B2B selling. So if, if you would like, we can dig a little bit more into that, of course. All right, let's, let's go on that journey together. All right, cool. So like think about reality makeover TV shows. So you're like Queer Eye on Netflix, which I highly recommend, Restaurant Impossible, Biggest Loser, Extreme Makeover, makeover Home Edition, Bar Rescue. They all follow a a choreography where the individual who is the host of the show is the expert, right? And what they do is really interesting. They flip the order of the traditional choreography in these things, meaning that, again, as salespeople, we always tend to lead with ourselves, right? Like, this is why we're great. This is why we're awesome. Did I mention how awesome we are? Well, on those shows, what do they do? Well, first of all, on each one of those shows, these people have raised their hand, right? They're investing time because they know they've got an issue. They just don't know how broad it is, how big it is, and what the solution is. It's why your leads probably reach out to you. Beginning of every single one of those shows, the individuals show up and they do an alignment, right? They're like, hey, why are we here? What's going on? We saw your application video, but tell us more about it. And then they disarm through transparency, through being themselves, through authenticity. And then they dig into, hey, have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? Have you thought about this? Right? They bring ideas. They bring opportunities. They help that individual see that even what they thought was possible, they could do more. Right? And they do that through, they build credibility through that process. They become the advisor, the consultant, instead of the person trying to convince them. And they lead to their solution. That's the flip for everybody. Super easy to change the order. Instead of starting with you, start with them, lead to you, right? That's what they do in reality makeover TV shows. And in every single episode at the end, what happens? There's 
They're all crying together about the huge success they've had and that we're going to be friends forever, right? Isn't that what you want with your customers? You lead to your solution. You build credibility on the path. You build trust and you build long lasting relationships based on the success that you found together. So it sounds like you're saying that, um, you know, because obviously the buyer needs to be compelled to action, right? So in this case, when you're taking them through that emotional journey, they almost feel like they're taking that action themselves. Well, yeah, absolutely. It's really about this situation. Like if you think about, I, I don't know if you've ever gone to a personal trainer before or anything like that, but you know, you wouldn't go to a personal trainer and go, hey, listen, here's 50 bucks. Um, I want to lose a couple pounds, like maybe five pounds in the next three months. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk over to that treadmill and I'm going to go walk on it for 10 minutes. I'm going to do 30 push-ups, and then I'll be out of your hair, right? Like that would be stupid. Like what's the point of the personal trainer? The personal trainer's job is to sit there and go, hey, listen, I think you can accomplish more than you thought you could. Have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Hey, based on what your goals really are and what we think you can accomplish, I'm going to put together a plan for you that's going to help you get there with maybe the least amount of friction possible. Are you cool with that? Who wouldn't say yes to that, right? And that's our job as a salesperson is to go, hey, this is how you view your world. Absolutely cool. We work with a lot of customers and clients like yours that have seen this and this as an issue too. Have you seen that? Especially if you're selling the companies that their world is online, you can actually experience what it's like to be a consumer and bring fresh ideas to them. Like, hey, we went through this process. We saw this and this. It was something that we used to do a lot at Exact Target where we would explore what it was like to be a consumer of theirs. They would share what their issues are and we would go, hey, have you thought about this as an opportunity or this? It's not that hard, right? And take them through the data and the logic around that. And then again, based on whether it, there's alignment and how far they want to go with it, you then go to, hey, listen, based on our understanding of what you're trying to accomplish and a couple of these new ideas, this is the path we would take. And again, it's simple. It doesn't require all new slides. It just means let's change the order of them. Move that NASCAR slide to the end. Move that award slide to the end and use it. You build credibility through the approach that you take and your consulting nature, not through your awards, your accolades, and your NASCAR slide. I mean, those reality makeover TV shows, why would those be boring if every episode started with 10 minutes of the individual sharing all the awards they've won and all the people they've helped? You'd be like, ugh. Like, get to it, right? Make it about the customer. Todd, you mentioned that those slides, like the famous logo slide, that that can actually be polarizing. Can you explore that a little bit for me? Oh, I'd love to. So, like, think about that for all of you. And I, when I was a chief revenue officer in my, old, my last company, Power Reviews, I had a joke for my team. And it was a joke, but everybody was kind of like, I don't know if I want to push that button. But it, the joke was, if I see a NASCAR slide, in the first five slides of any deck you've put together, whoever did it's fired, right? <laughs> Not the funniest joke in the world, but there was a reason I was so passionate about this and here's why. Imagine that you are walking into a presentation, it's a consensus sale, right? So you've got 10 buyers that are sitting there waiting to hear from you. Now, due to cognitive bias that we all have, right? Sir Francis Bacon, the year 1620, he was the one that theorized this idea that once we've established an opinion, we will take in all incoming information to support that opinion, whether or not that information actually supports your opinion or not, right? And so the same thing happens with the logic that you share. You can't imagine that all 10 of those people walk into your presentation with an absolutely clean slate and no opinion, right? They all do. And so let's think about those 10. Five of them are for you. You put your NASCAR slide up that's got all these amazing logos. Those five people We'll look at that and go, wow, yeah, that's impressive. You know what? If they're good enough for them, they're good enough for us. I'm going to use that. Right? Cool. Same slide, same logos, the five that are against you, what are they going to do? Well, three of them are going to look at it and go, oh, those are some big companies. Wow, we're going to be a small fish in a big pond. You know what? I'm going to use this against them. And those other two are looking at it going, wow, these logos are all industries. Like, do they even know us? Do they know? We've got very specific requirements in our industry and they're working on all of these. I'm going to use this against them. That same thing happens with each one of your logic slots. One quick example that I think is kind of funny, but 
and it was me, I guess I was being, I, I hope I didn't come across as a jerk when I did this to the client, but one of my clients is in the antivirus technology space. Slide number two is their award slide. And they, this happened last year. So at end of 2021, when I had this discussion, the award slide had, we are the antivirus technology provider of the year for 2019, right? And they're so proud of it. Like, cause there's so many in that space. Why wouldn't you be proud of it? And so we're going through it and they popped that up. And I was like, hey, quick question. Who won it in 2020? Cause clearly you didn't, right? Otherwise you would have had the 2020. And it sounds like in that space with a lot of companies, there is somebody better that maybe we should be talking to. And they're like, ah, we hate you, Todd. But the point being, think about your logical slides, right? If you've got an audience that comes in with any kind of preconceived opinion, what you're doing is you're not bringing them together, you're pushing them apart, you're pushing them into the corners that they already came into the room with. What happens in stories is stories from a behavioral science perspective, when stories are being played for individuals and they're hooked up to what's called an fMRI machine, a functional magnetic resonance imaging machine. The scientists that are looking at this, there's 10 people watching a movie together. It looked like they were looking at 10 of the exact same brains. Now, isn't that what you want when you're selling to a consensus audience that all of these people are thinking and paying attention and listening on the exact same wavelength versus pushing them into their corners further? I think it you know, presents a tremendous opportunity and it's a simple flip reorder your slides so they not only tell a great story, but they lead to your solution instead of lead with it. And that's so interesting because I do think that you're giving people ammunition to pick you apart when you give them those facts. But when you're telling them a story, they can't help but go along that journey with you. Um, so just to be clear, you're not saying abandon the slide decks altogether, but you're suggesting improvements that give it more of a story arc. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if you want some simple way to think about it, right? Like what I like to write down on a whiteboard is just A to B. So this is the choreography that you can use at the highest level where A is the customer's current state, B is the customer's potential future state. And in the middle is why A is maybe not sustainable or maybe not exactly the way that you view it. If all you do is reorder it that way, start with the customer, teach them a little bit about their current state, give them a new perspective on it, and then lead to what a potential future state looks like. Again, instead of leading with it, that's the arc that all of these shows use that makes you wanna watch them and makes you wanna cry along with them at the end of every episode, but also has tremendous impacts on the way that you sell in a B2B world and it's really not that hard. All right. Well, I am, I am a bit of a reality TV fan, so that gives me a lot to think about, Todd. Thanks so much for your insight on this topic. Well, thanks for having me, and I hope I haven't ruined reality makeover TV shows for all of you, but uh, it's give you a new lens the next time you do. Absolutely. Hey, thanks, everybody, for joining us on this episode of Closing Time, the show for go-to-market leaders. Be sure to subscribe, hit that bell for notifications, and we'll see you next time.